to see you. Hey, no, we haven't met, but I'm Dan. Nice to meet you. So I feel weird like standing up and lecturing at you guys. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the framework and then I wanna hear like what you guys already have in place, what you guys are already thinking about and then we can just kinda workshop from there. Um, so to folks that don't know me, I'll quickly introduce myself. I played at Pitt uh, 2010 to 2014, uh, captain the team in 2013-2014 and what I do now is run a creative marketing agency with Hannah uh, called Piper Creative. And so we're creating content all the time for ourselves, for clients, um, thinking about marketing all the time. That's like the prism through which I kind of view the world and storytelling. So um, the big thing that I wanted to come and like put in front of you guys, and if this is completely 101 obvious stuff, just rip me a new one. Um, but it's understanding through the lens of sales, marketing, and branding. What we do with our company is a lot of top of the funnel branding by trying to put content out there and trying to put you know, more touch points, more familiarity with the brand of Piper Creative in the same way that you guys are um, like you did the halftime interviews on Twitter, you, you're like doing new things from a content standpoint, that's all top of the funnel new touch points with people, but what's actually gonna move the needle is a really concerted, focused, well-strategized sales effort. Um, I don't necessarily know if you need to put it like a CRM in place, but there are literally free CRMs where if you wanted to, that would be the type of thing that I'm sure there's not another program doing. Uh, period. So that's kind of the framework that I want to bring it to and then where I think the real creativity happens is in the marketing side which is where it kind of occupies this space in the middle where branding like um, you know my mom's friend's husband like follows Pit Ultimate on Twitter because I played once and then he got into Ultimate but like he's not producing a recruit for us anytime soon right he just is more or less a fan what marketing is, is very much, um, a couple years ago we ran that commercial for pits, like during a semifinal or a game, that's marketing. It was played to an audience of ultimate Frisbee people. It was very targeted, it was, there were certainly potential recruits watching, and it was different than top of the line branding because anyone outside of the ultimate community that targeted demographic was completely unaware that it existed. In the same way that like the team is so good about knowing your role and knowing your strengths as it pertains to on the field, like you need to do a real assessment of who are our sales people, like are just naturally charismatic, like they're gonna win people over and getting as many touch points with them. If you look through the history of the program, you know, Saul Graves is a fucking saucy salesman. <laughs> when I was recruited into the financial services firm that I was in before doing Piper, there was this guy who came in and all he did was come in for 45 minutes, but I swear this was like one of the most charismatic, uh, like macho human beings I've ever met. And he came in and he just talked his shit, like he had no script, he had no whatever, he was just talking about how awesome the organization was and all this other stuff. And he did that to 11 people all at once. And that was like what he was there to do. He wasn't there to like, show you where to sign the paper. He wasn't there to show you the detail that is more scalable. He had that skill set and he was completely enabled to go in and do that. So that's like, your, in terms of your own process for that, recognizing who those people are within the group and enabling that because that's much more valuable and, and the other type of thing that just isn't necessarily being utilized by other programs. And then on the content side, there's, all this top of the funnel type of content like, hey, we just beat Central Florida, like here's the picture of the team, yada yada. Is there anything, and then we have like the alumni newsletter, which is for alumni. Is there any family of content that is oriented around people coming to play College Ultimate? That falls squarely in that middle um, point of marketing to the specific demo, which is there's no reason, like why does the alumni newsletter come out? Because you want alumni to support the team and donate and do this other stuff. Like there should be content specifically targeted for this group and there's a multitude of ways to do that. There's every freshman explaining why they decided to come to Pitt as soon as they make the team. There's 
things like the world's players talking about the value of the program. If I have all that information over here and I only have 17% of that information over here, I just feel more secure and comfortable in this decision. I, I feel more comfortable that there's actually something here versus the scary and the unknown, which is really what, to some degree, people are trying to avoid or um, are, are fearful of when they're making a decision like this. If they know what they're getting into and it seems like it, it's shit, that's the type of thing that will make people more comfortable. I don't see it always like, yes, you should do that, no, you shouldn't do that. It should be start with something and then just build the momentum and that muscle. But to me, like the fact that there isn't as well-established of a content marketing vehicle, there's the broad branding, there's alumni marketing, where is the stuff where the people who are making it aren't thinking, we're making this for alumni, they aren't thinking, we're making this for everyone, they're thinking, we're making this for people making this decision. And then it just lives in its own kind of universe. And it doesn't mean that it's not still valuable as branding. There's people who follow Pit Ultimate on YouTube and they see that you guys are doing this, and even though they don't have a kid and they're not making this decision, they're like, shit, they're different. And that also contributes to the branding component. I think, I think that the way to approach that type of content is to keep it as minimally salesy as possible. Like if I feel like I can predict the next minute and 15 seconds, five seconds in, that's not what it's really about. I think that what's compelling is less of like a freshman or anyone on the team like trying to sell someone, like just like looking you in the eye, like you should come to Pitt because X, Y, Z, N, L. Instead, like telling a story about your fondest memory, like, like a funny story from the pr previous year. Because that's what you're giving someone when you give them that is instead of like here are the facts on which you make your decision, here's a story of the 12 of us laughing like hyenas in our big van on the way down to Easterns and what I'm doing as the potential recruit is I'm picturing myself in that van. That's what you wanna give people. You wanna, you wanna lay out the story in front of them and then almost let them insert themselves into it. Give them something that they don't know in the form of a story and allow them to insert themselves into it. As long as it ends with the, are you in? <laughs> so Nick said that Nick, Nick's specific words when I asked him about another commercial was, as long as I don't have to say, are you in? <laughs> <laughs> that commercial did before was definitely more of on a sales pitch side. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that worked. That worked in a different way because it was so unexpected. It was so, like when you're the first person to do something like that, you get a completely different appraisal because, oh, they were creative and distinct enough to make that choice. But down the road, every other one will be viewed through a different lens. So in the same sense, the content that you're making right uh, around this, it doesn't have to be like the most perfectly engaging, crazy thing because there aren't a lot of other people competing to create that type of content. But where it's gonna have to evolve into is something very raw, very authentic, and very fly on the wall that like if there's, like to me, one of the most valuable things, more so than like Pitt's great because it's after some big win and you guys are in your stretching circle and everyone's just cutting up. Like Dan's busting nose balls, blah, 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 blah. blah. And the camera is just sitting as if you're in that circle, like, the, like this is your space in the circle that you would have been in, observing all this. Because that's like some of our fondest memories of these experiences, right? And they're having that in some way, shape, and form with their team right now. Oh, I could have an even greater version of that after winning Stanford Invite, taking all that in. But you need someone who's thinking about that in that moment, because you're not gonna be doing that. You're gonna be exhausted, you're gonna be on the endorphin high after the win, and you're just gonna be like, I can't wait to get to the spring break house and drink, right? Instead, there has to be someone who thinks to themselves, this is that moment, this is that moment that almost no one gets to experience that is really, really distinct to the pit experience. And I'm just gonna place the camera here to kind of absorb that. And maybe nothing that interesting happens. That's why you have editing, that's why you have post-production. But those are the type of moments that actually make pit unique, that allow people to place themselves into it versus kind of pulling them into it, if that makes sense. This is kind of a general like strategy question, but if we were to do something like that, do we post it on, I feel like we don't post it on every social media we have. So, because, I, because that would be like, 
why are we following all these accounts if we're going to see the same thing on every single account? So we talk about this specifically. We don't have much repetition between our different platforms. So Piper exists on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch. Am I missing one? No, we don't really use Facebook. We don't really use Facebook that much. So nothing is completely repetitive there. And when I say that, like at most, an image that's used for, so I, I did a podcast that came out on Wednesday. An image that's used associated with that podcast is on both LinkedIn and Instagram, but the copy is different. So all of our content, like you can't just listen to the entire podcast on our YouTube channel. There's snippets of it, but it's a different experience. And that what that's actually what leads to consumption across those different platforms. Because, well, I like Pitt on Twitter, I like Pitt on Instagram, and they're telling me that they have a YouTube and it's different. Then I'm getting this more, and I'm opting in to a more engaging experience versus people who do a Facebook Live, they record it, it goes up, and then they pull it off and they put the exact same video onto LinkedIn and three other platforms. It's like, why well, do you know what this is? Like, why would I engage with it? Why would I share it? Why would I bother to follow you here if you're just putting the same thing up everywhere? So that's a very intuitive question, yes. So with what you were saying about like having just camera on more often. To yes. find, like, it's, that seems something that for all of us is difficult to do, especially when we're all playing. That, that's what I think about like with Twitter as well. Right. Is that like it's great to get something to tweet, but not everyone's good at it. Right. You know, like, whoever is not playing does it. Would it be worth bringing someone else on that doesn't play to take care of this kind of stuff? I mean, to me, that's like the ultimate. That's like this question that it's there's no perfect answer to, right? Like I wouldn't be comfortable with 99% of people producing the vlog for Piper, but because I knew Hannah and I had met Hannah previously and seen her work, like I knew that it was going to work. So if someone fits that bill and they're like, I would love to hang out with you guys for the entire season. I know I'm not that good, but like I love shooting and, and doing social media stuff then hell yeah, like that would be great. But don't make the mistake of, well, we have this role that needs filled and let's just find someone and force them in when they don't necessarily fit. That's, I think that would actually be more detrimental than positive. Like doing it just for the sake of doing it isn't gonna work. It's, what's gonna work is people who are invested, people who have a why, people who have an entire framework for what it is that they're doing. Everyone thinks when they're creating the content that that them not necessarily having all those things in place doesn't matter, but it's intuitive to all the people consuming it. So like when you have a why and a whole philosophy behind what you're doing, that resonates in ways that might not necessarily be like consciously acknowledged by most of the audience, but that is what leads to people really being loyal to the stuff you're putting out. And the other side of it, so, so answering that question in a different way of like bringing someone on to do that, like there, the other thing that has to change is what is, what is culture, and I mean, as the leaders of the team, you guys have a lot of power and agency in this, but what the actual culture of the team is when it comes to making those choices. So we're, our company is in, like from the jump, has had a vlog that we, like that's a core offering that we're doing, it's just the like DNA of the company. And when you're in something like this where you have the value of every year that you're turning over a new leaf, every year there's new policies and new plans and new schemes, but there is still some degree of like institutional inertia, for lack of a better word. And the choice of like at the first tournament when Lemberg pulls out his phone for like we're in the van for a debrief of the tournament or something like that, like the what, what immediately um, submarines that is if someone's in the back super cynical about it and just like talking shit, not in like a fun way, but like in a like, why the fuck are we doing this type of way? Or y y you understand like the energy that they could portray that kind of just like, no one else is excited to talk to the camera because someone in the back is gonna bust their balls later. Like the biggest aspect of that is the buy-in. Like I can completely without hesitation sh show up here and put up two cameras and I'm just like, that's natural. That's just what we do. But if it's weird and like it's uncomfortable and three people immediately give a shit for coming, the, coming in with cameras, it completely changes the way in which I'm gonna act in front of the camera, if that makes sense. So that's also has to be a conversation 
outside of the social media group. Like you have to get, once again, coming back to that sales, you have to get the one-to-one buy-in of this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is how it's gonna make Pitt better and differentiated from absolutely every other program in the country, and it's gonna be awesome. Like pooling people in, and then once you have enough people in, like you understand how these groups work, you have the leaders, you have a couple other key stakeholders, and then every freshman's gonna be like, yeah, this is awesome, like they're just gonna, follow along, but you have to set the stage for that to happen in the future. If, if someone is in your head right now on the team who's gonna be like out on this idea, like the, like the person that would be the biggest risk for something like that, you need to have the conversation around, look, we're concerned about it being this. If you don't wanna really be a part of it, like if you, like, you don't have to move them all the way to like, hi guys, I'm Steve, like, like talking to the camera. You don't have to take them all the way there, but if they just don't want to be on camera, they're like, this is not something I'm about, it's not something I'm interested in, it's like, cool, we will keep you out of it more or less, but we're gonna do this and we just need the like, we need to understand why and that is also gonna change their perception of it. They're not gonna rip you guys when it comes up. We kinda, we kinda started to do something like that. So the year that we had tried to do the documentary for us at Nationals, Noah and Lem had the idea of kind of doing a season long documentary, so like. We talked about that once at like Winter League. Yeah. We didn't end up doing it, I don't, it just kind of didn't really work out, but I think, I think it was very intimidating to try and create a whole documentary, but I guess yeah. what you're going on about is like little tidbits, just through the course of the season, that's something very doable, and I think that's something that we should do. It's also long lasting, we have enough stuff every other week or weekly. And the other, the other way that I talk about it when we're talking about it with clients is they're like, we're coming in and we're shooting videos for them for LinkedIn. And they're like, I want it to like have the perfect framing and I want it to be this long and I want to hit these three topics. And I'm like, you've never spoken into a camera before. Let's just work on like that basic muscle of creating a piece of content like this. And then we'll get there, like we'll get there, but we need to start on first base. And so in that same sense, like going after something too audacious, even, even setting something like, you know, we're going to put out a five minute video every two weeks, that might be too much after the first week's like, fuck, I don't, there's no way this is gonna happen. Put, put yourself in a position to get those early wins and it's, those wins aren't oriented around how many views it has or anything like that. Literally, all it is is like, oh, we're learning how to do this and in the same way like we talk about all the time, episode 45 is orders of magnitude better than episode four for our vlog or any of these other things. Like You're just gonna build that content creating muscle, get more comfortable with it, and then six months down the line or if you think about Pitt, three years into the future, you're just in a completely different place than everyone else. How do we know what we're doing is the right thing? Like, you don't. <laughs> so how, how, so how, are you, how are you changing what you do in the future if you don't know what you're doing is right or wrong? So there's two avenues to that. So there's a really good book called The Creative Curve written by Alan Gannett. And the whole premise of that is that the underrated aspect of creativity is what you're putting in at the top. And by that I mean, who are you consuming? If you're reading uh, Tolstoy and like the best authors of all time, you have a much better chance of writing a great book than if you're reading some buffoon. Similarly, if you're trying to create four minute YouTube vlogs, what I would be doing is going around and trying to find every single vlog of sports teams. Which ones do you like the best? What are they doing? What choices are they making? And not consuming it purely as entertainment, consuming it as a fellow creator and breaking apart the things that you like that they do, the things that seem to engage you. On one end, that's gonna inform the choices that you're making when you're in the creative stage. The second aspect of that is the feedback that you're getting and frankly, there's gonna be a lot of complete quiet. One of the rules of the internet is called the 99-1 rule, which is 90% of the people that consume your shit will never tell you about it, will never give you feedback, will never engage whatsoever. 9% will engage every once in a while, and then there's people who just seem to respond to almost freaking everything, right? And so what you get confused by, <laughs> there you go, see, right? So oh, what, what, what confuses your brain, because we've got these old 
uh, unevolved brains is you're like, oh, this one percent of people, like that is the truth. That is what people think, and you can overcorrect to whatever that feedback is. These three people think we're awesome, so we must be the best videographers in the world. It's like that's probably not the case. But conversely, if there's negative, like you need to adjust. You'd be like, like one of the biggest pain points is people aren't going to say boring like they're not just going to yell that like this is a boring video and you need to spice it up but if you're looking at youtube analytics and you see that no one is watching past the 55th second of a five minute video then you've got a clue that like oh we're not maintaining people's attention and we need to look at this part of the video why is this putting people to sleep so those are the two aspects like there's going to be feedback once you get it out there which is why we always push people to ship what do people say what do people think because even in this group, like this is a pretty big group. If everyone was thinking about content, it can slow you down because everyone has ideas, but also you have a lot of eyes who could like decide that something's good, but better than this group, this is still all pit people, this is still all ultimate people, this is still like, you guys are very, very, very similar. Putting it out into the world and seeing how people engage with it is actually gonna give you a greater uh, degree of feedback than talking it through here eight different times. Who are you guys consuming? Who's doing content well? I want an answer from everyone. The Ringer. The Ringer? What's, what are they doing well? Um, they have, like, I mean, you and I have had this conversation before. They have this uh, weekly show that I really like called NBA Desktop, and the concept is just unbelievably simple, but it's just very entertaining. It's a Google Doc that is open on this guy's screen. The videos are usually five minutes long total. It's a Google Doc of links that he has found of the NBA that are funny, interesting, controversial, and he will go through them. He will not go through all of them, but he will talk about them and he will consult other funny people or people that know this content well and consult them throughout the episode. He does one or two interviews. And one thing that he does is that, that's super interesting is he never goes through all the links. So he leaves you hanging on a couple of them because they definitely film something for all of them, but they're not showing you all of them. So it like has an element of I wonder what he said about that, but it's also like this is the best content. Like I don't have to go through it all myself, and I'm getting the best stuff from the NBA in five minutes. So let me give you one more detail, and I want I literally want someone doing content well from every single person in this room. What we do at Piper is at our Monday meeting we have a section where everyone is sharing like, I came across this Instagram account and I love it because, and that gives us this framework of all people who are thinking creatively, thinking about this content, what do they really like? And then we can maybe steal one element of what they're doing. Like we found this one Instagram account and they just do these crests, like old school crests, and like we need a crest, let's try to make <laughs> one like that. Because it's, it's like really fucking sick. And similarly, you being able to create that within the social media group or how, whatever channel, like I'm not gonna tell you exactly the process for it, but have a way when you come across something that is distinct and relevant and really fucking good, let help other people see that. It shouldn't be exclusively in your brain. And then you also set that precedent of, I have this channel where there's always good stuff that's, that I can find and it's relevant and that's gonna raise all your games. I would, I would sink your teeth a little bit more into people generally in the sports arena, like what sucks about this? Like what sucks about this? strength and conditioning coach showing off their gym. Like, why is this boring to me? I don't think you necessarily need to share that with people, but think about that yourself. And then when someone does it really well, give that to other people so that you can all move forward with that shared understanding and that shared knowledge. We'll talk about a piece of content and we'll say like, well, how would you know, this person do that? Or like, how would they think about something like that? Or, oh, we're, we're stealing their technique to some degree. And that informs the decisions that we're making. Art is stealing artfully. Creating any sort of content that just shows all these faces to a bunch of people as really knowing your shit, that's the type of thing that even further, like when Hafiz shows up to Impulse next time, it's an even, even bigger deal. Or when you decide, oh, I'm gonna coach Hampton's ultimate team, or wh wherever it is. Like, there's a different degree of respect and authority that you grant yourself when someone has learned from you over an extended period of time. And that's also thinking about things differently in the form of creating something for the ultimate community, so we're in that marketing space, establishing yourselves, but also lending credence to your authority and how much 
you clearly know all this, it, even if it's not necessarily connected, or it, it could be like your freaking scion. You'd be like, and we know all this because we go to pit, or something like that. Like, that's gonna rub a certain percentage of people the wrong way, but other people are gonna be like, well, fuck, they know all that because <laughs> pit. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's kind of how that stuff works. It doesn't always have to be so on the nose. But the other kind of idea that I wanna, I wanna share with you guys is something that uh, Hannah and I talk about a lot, which is this idea of when you, um, when you put out more and more content at scale, there's a self-reinforcing aspect to fame, which is um, kind of the currency that you're trading on with people who are really ambitious and aspirational. These 12 people that are coming to pit partially want to come because they love Ultimate, partially come because they want to learn, but there's also a little bit of them coming like, I want to be on ESPN. I want to be on that Ulti World stream. I want to be that star, right? Right? And so, Part of the reason that that reinforces, part of the reason that Charlie and whoever know more details about Pitt than the other team is because you've just put more of the information out there for them to soak up, which leads them to feeling more comfortable, <laughs> which is gonna lead them to feeling more comfortable talking about you. So I'll give you a micro example of that because this is only like a recent thing that I came to realize, but it's very, Weird. I had a friend who came down for the event that I did in January who, like, we didn't go to the same school, but we've known each other for a while, um, would like visit each other's campuses and, and drink together. And he came and came to the event, and then afterwards, I was having trouble asking him about himself. Like, the conversation, this is gonna sound incredibly narcissistic, but this is not like the intent of it. The conversation kept coming around to me and what I was doing. And I was trying to self-assess, why was that the case? Like, why weren't we talking more about him? Because I would like throw it out there and the conversation would kind of wither and then he'd ask about me again as opposed to continuing to offer about himself. And there's things associated with shame or self-confidence or, or anything that could be related to that. But once that started to replicate, what I started to realize is we're two people who don't see each other very often at a party. And you know, we see each other every 10 months, we barely know what's going on, but like we kind of are connected on two social media platforms. And for whatever reason, all this content's coming out about me. All these details of what's going on with my life, my company, what I'm working on, and for whatever reason you're not. Then we're sitting at a table and you have 18 data points about me and I have three data points about you. And in that environment, both of us are more comfortable talking about me which then leads to more data points be coming out and therefore that differential extending itself. So what that means is I like, do you still work at Pepsi? Like I, I, I'm like asking this question that's embarrassing for me to ask, it's uncomfortable for you to answer, but when you can sink your teeth into this 202 level question about what it is that I'm doing, you feel more self-confident because you've asked that question and I love talking about myself anyways, particularly when it's nuanced and not just like, so what are you doing, right? And so what you're doing by creating this content or creating a show like that where maybe it's, it's Hafiz and Matt, but like this week Dan's on, this week Noah's on, this week Kevin's on, um, you're creating this universe of people that everyone else is more familiar with and when I'm coming in as an announcer or I'm coming in as a potential recruit or whatever and I know 13 players on Pitt and two players on UNC or, or creating that type of differential, it comes back to that comfort thing of, like, oh, I know people there. Even, even though you don't know them, you feel like you know them, and that's where you wanna be. Like, I can, I can pretty safely guess that if the ringer was just like, hey, Hafiz, will you come work with us? You'd be pretty- I would drop everything I'm doing. <laughs> exactly, and it's partially because of the audience and, and like the cool people that they talk to, but it's also because like, I feel like I know Mallory Rubin, I feel like I know uh, Jason Concepcion and all these other characters within that Ringer universe, and that's what you're creating with the content. The, the, the halftime interviews were awesome when you were doing those videos between games because it was introducing people to the Pit Ultimate universe, and there was like someone who showed up like, I don't know who this is, but because I'm invested in the team, I already know the his, I mean, I'm completely sold, so I'm not like the ideal person for this, but I already kind of know you guys, oh, this person's kind of interesting or cool, like, oh, Lindbergh's really fucking boring, I don't want to hear him again, like, that, you know what I mean? Like, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be perfect in that sense, that's what it comes back to, like that running the experiment and iterating on these things is, you get to put that content out scale and some of the stuff's gonna flop and no one's gonna penalize you for that. There's absolutely no meaningful penalty 
to a piece of content flopping. So we gotta bring those back then. I think that I think that's yeah. an absolute layup. I think that the reason it stopped was just because we have different people on Twitter and we just need to whoever is responsible just gonna be a rule. Like you're doing everything right. you're on Twitter. And so here's the other thing. Like I'm not super interested in your guys' tweets like in the middle of January during the week. Like just in terms of me as a consumer, like I don't really care. But on a weekend when you're in Florida, when you're in, in Stanford, I'm reading every fucking tweet. So when you know you have that captive attention, you have the attention of your whole fan base, the greater ultimate community, that's the time to put something out. Don't, I mean, if you're experimenting with stuff, if you're just trying to figure out like the four minute day in the life video, sure, you can put that out at a different time. But when you have something good, or just in general, like we have a philosophy of like, we wanna do these type of videos, that weekend is the time to do it, which I know you're doing these other things. Maybe they're recorded beforehand. Maybe, maybe you recorded all the freshman testimonials the week before and they're edited, and then they just go up after each game that weekend because everyone's watching, right? Take advantage of when you have that attention.